Enjoy a seat at the table for great conversation and good company. Welcome to And Good Company. I'm Sarah Fiedelholtz. We all know a great dinner party isn't really about the food. It's about the people seated around the table engaging in lively discussions. And Good Company gives you a seat at the table to enjoy smart and interesting conversations as they happen. I am so pleased to have back again at, my, at this table, Charles Shepard, the president and CEO of the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. Welcome. I'm delighted to be here. Well, and th we have, the reason also I'm having you here is not only because I find what you do interesting and exciting, is because the museum is celebrating its 100th um, anniversary or its centennial. And you actually, I was thinking about it, so you've been um, the president CEO for, it'll be 19 years, you said. 19 years, this, in this year coming. This year. So that's almost a fifth of the museum's history. It, it's a long run. If, I, and in fact, I think I've been at the head longer than anybody ever has. Right, because, well, there were also some, when I was reading about the 100, there were some people who were short yep. uh, terms and some, most of them weren't, no, there was no one who, some were five years, yeah. not really a long. But, um, so I want to talk about, um, I mean, it's a, I mean, obviously, when people think about museums, you know, the Metropolitan or the Art Institute, obviously those are hundreds of years old. But what does it mean that a city, a mid-sized city like Fort Wayne, to have a art museum that um, is 100 years old? Well, I, th I, think, I think you've hit upon something very important, that you could exist for 100 years is, is great. Now, that you could exist and prosper for 100 years, even greater because, in fact, we came from humble roots. Uh, we had to slug it out in tough years. Uh, we had to slug it out in, in recent tough years, even in, in my tenure when the economy went so sour. Um, and, and then you get to you know, tough it out through COVID and all these other things. And through all of this, we've always come out stronger. And I feel blessed that in, in my 19 years, every couple of years we do another big leap and think, wow, I, I, I never would have thought we could have made it here. And we did. Right. So last time when I had you and Amanda on, we actually were just talking about the, you were just starting on the focus, uh, really putting your emphasis on glass yes. and uh, glass art. And since that time, you really have really put your a huge stake in the ground with um, the art, blown art, glass art. So yes. tell me um, about what happened. And I think it's an interesting story about Understanding what your role is of how this, you know, with the, it's the Fendel, right? Um, yes. Collection. Yes. Your role of how this huge collection came to Fort Wayne. Well, and to, to begin with, I'm one of the few president CEOs that's also the chief curator. And, and why would that be? It, it, it basically is because I have a vision for that collection and what the collection drives throughout the, I mean, really the collection drives everything. And Are you talking about the, the overall? O overall. So this and is the permanent that, collection. In my, vis in my vision, uh, glass began to be more and more predominant. You know, it's, it's potential, let's say. It's potential, because we didn't have much yet. And we, we would get a piece here, we'd get a piece there. Next thing you know, we've got another chihuly. Next thing you know, we've got three other chihulies. And we think, okay, so we have some- And then you got the blank, uh, the big- The big Martin blank. And the big Martin blank, it's interesting you, you remember that because that piece, 52 feet long, uh, from a sh famous Chicago building's lobby. Yeah, but you've saved but it then from in the a basement. basement. Yes, right. they're gonna throw it away. Right, and then you got and it, and then it was on loan. It was right? on loan. It, it had to be on loan for a period of time to help all the tax relief happen for the buyer uh, and, and then the donor. Okay, so that, pe that piece and that action though, it, it, that was more pivotal than anybody remembers. People think that the big Chihuly chandelier was the big pivotal thing. No, it's the Martin Blank because everybody in the glass world knows Martin, everybody in the collecting glass world in particular, and he's a lovable guy and, and he's a warm, friendly, he's a hugger, you know, so everybody's like, you saved Martin's piece. 
the big piece. It was his biggest indoor piece. And we did save it. So all of a sudden, I would you know, be at Chicago Pier Show or something, you know, or at a cocktail party somewhere where other collectors are, you know, and they think, you're the Martin. You're the guy that saved Martin. Right. And they think, I don't know you. And they go, you know, we know you because you got it and you got it to Fort Wayne. Now we heard this Fort Wayne story. And, and so momentum, you know, right. as we said, you know, a year or so goes by and you've had some good momentum. Now you've got even more momentum. And we're probably the only organization that actually prospered during the lockdown of, of all this virus stuff because we went to Zoom almost immediately. And the an interesting thing about art collectors everywhere probably, but glass collectors stick together right. all over the country. They know right. each other, yeah. okay? And they're all, you know, they've all had good careers. Right. Uh, most of the collectors that I know are retired. Right. They're used to traveling everywhere they want to go, you know, right. gathering together, whatever. They right. can't do it. So they've, they've got a screen. Right. And all they can do is sit in the house with the screen. They want to be entertained. Right. And so I got a lot of invitations to, you know, could, could you on a Wednesday afternoon uh, a Thursday night, a Saturday morning. Could you give us a little program? Right. And, and you were very used to, one, you are very used to because, first of all, you were very used to because you, you also looked to a lot of the purchasing online through auctions yeah. and things. So you were very used to that. But um, also, you also really have intentionally, before, really were traveling around to the different art shows or art museums and really fostering a lot of inroads into this what is a small community because I don't think people realize although I happen to love um, glass I mean most people really like know Murano glass and then of course they yeah. know the, from the, the Seattle world like Chihuly and then all of the students from there but it was really thought of just as a utilitarian craft because it you know you had Blanco that made glasses and Corning that made dishes yeah. and lenses there wasn't and so people a lot of museums dismissed it as just and, like a and still do. craft, right? And still do. But you really intentionally said, and really, I mean, this has been a mission sort of um, for, I would say probably what I noticed was like the last six years. And then really, you, it's sort of nice that it sort of has really made that tipping point at the hundredth. So you started to yeah. do these Zoom calls and talk about. Well, and, and that's where Sylvia Fendel's daughter, um, you know, Sylvia, had passed away right. and her daughter is charged in the will with finding a home for the glass. And there were how many? 33? 32. 32, 32 pieces. pieces. Okay. And, and very nice pieces. You saw them. They're, yes. they're gorgeous. Yeah. They're, and they're all museum quality. Right. Sylvia had great taste. Right. And Sylvia also, I mean, just so people understand, it's when I, because I wanted to understand, okay, how did this glass, I mean, her um, first husband, I think, yes, was uh, one of the husbands, she had yes. one passed away, were very involved with in the shoe industry and brought back Adidas in the 80s and 90s. So they, that's how they made their wealth. So these are not just like, you know, little pieces. I mean, these are these, significant these are major pieces. pieces. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so yeah, her first husband, Mr. Fendel, second husband, Mr. Rosenbach, and they, they collected until Mr. Fendel died, and then Mr. Rosenbach collected with her. And her daughter, Allison, um, is trying to decide what public place, what, a museum, probably, right? But what museum and, and how much attention would it get and how, how serious would they take it and so on and so forth. And she uh, somehow got my video. It, this monotonous 90 minute thing that would drive you crazy of me yakking about glass and what I'm going to do with glass and you know we're going to be the Midwest Center for glass is what we're going to be that you know and I, I say that everywhere but you know we keep saying it right will I? so right. she watches this thing and I think I think she found me amusing and said so I'll call this guy up you know I think she also found you very intelligent but I also will think you have excellent I've said this to you you have amazing hair so you well, are see, very pleasant maybe, to you know maybe it was the, no, maybe but you're it was very the pleasant hair. you might yeah. not realize you're very pleasant yeah. to look at and to listen to and you when and you're also well, very you. genuine and passionate and you well, do have a vision it, and and that's exactly what I tried to do in the video I I'm I'm talking nonstop, but I'm passionate about it I mean what I'm saying I, I think we can do it and she she calls and we had this fabulous conversation. Uh, in fact, we, we still talk, you know, once a week, once every couple of weeks. And she thought, you know, 
she's got to tell you, I'm in Manhattan, and I've never been to Fort Wayne, <laughs> but I think that you would show this glass. I think my mother would be proud that, in fact, you'd bring this glass that she's been a lifetime collecting to the people all the time. And I thought, that's exactly right, and, and that's exactly what we're doing. And now in that, and I've, I've, I've told you off camera, but I have to tell you this morning, okay. this story once again, because I think viewers would like to think about the, the sheer luck of this. In Sylvia's collection is a little piece by Carl Belling. And Carl Belling was a very successful physician in Massachusetts, and his wife Stephanie, also equally successful physician. And Carl had this urge to do something creative when he got in his 60s. And so he went into New York a couple times a month and t got taught how to make glass. And he wanted to cast glass. And so who did you get taught by? Bertil Valiant, the most famous sand cast glass maker in the world. And Carl is his student as a, you know, a still working physician. So Sylvia found a piece of Carl's glass when she was visiting Massachusetts in a little gallery that she would go to occasionally, and she bought the piece. She's even been, I think, in Stephanie and Carl's home. So, okay, here's this collection. Here's Carl's piece, and we call Carl, not knowing he passed away, we call Carl and say, we want to talk to Carl because we have a piece of his in the collection. And his wife, Stephanie, who we're talking to, says, well, Carl passed away six years ago, but I got to tell you, this is so exciting. He would have been thrilled. He never thought he'd be in a museum collection. He'd be so thrilled to know that. Well, that conversation led Stephanie and I uh, and, and my new curator, Jenna Gilley, to have several conversations. And they were really all about maybe we'll put seven or eight more pieces of Carl's work in your collection. And absolutely, love it. But, you know, it kind of snowballed. And at one point, you know, she's got her, her iPad or phone right. out here, and I can see glass behind right. her on the wall. She says, you're not asking me about any of that other glass. I said, well, I'm sorry. We were talking about Carl's work, and right. so I'm trying to be polite. Right. And she says, well, ask me about the other glass. I said, well, what is the other glass? She says, well, Carl and I collected glass. She said, um, she said, I don't even know how many pieces we have, but would you like the glass? Like all the glass. Like her, so, their personal collection. Their personal collection. So we're like, yes, we're screaming in the phone. Yes, we'll do it. We would love to do that. Do you have a list of what it is? No, I don't know what it is. We bought it over all these years. If you want a list, you got to come and make the list. So I said, Jenna. Jenna and Amy got on a plane. They went to Massachusetts. They made a list. They showed me pictures, and it was beautiful. So did they have any of the uh, pieces from the teacher, the master that? Yes, uh, yes. So oh, because the, the relationship was so tight. Right. So, so let's go back to Sylvia. So Sylvia passes. Allison picks right, us right. in the collection, leads us to Stephanie right, Belling. Right. Stephanie gave us 181 pieces of glass. When are they coming? They're here. Oh. Okay. They have not been shown. Them. Right. Well, you're gonna. Okay. You're gonna next. Okay. You're going into the next century. You need it. I mean, I was looking. It was funny because on the um, there's an aerial picture of the museum of where you added on. Yeah. And then I was sort of thinking to myself, well, they've got that parking lot in the back there. That's right. They're gonna need. You're gonna need a wing. Well, or something for the. Well, you're right. You're right. But you just sort of teed me up on a hot issue for me. Um, somebody was asking me. We, we we agonized all summer long. In in the team and in the board meetings, are we going to go into that parking lot? It'd probably take about seventeen million dollars. Is it, the, is it the, the year to do it? Well, it's the year to do it in the glass world because so many people, a lot of glass collectors are the same age. Right, because they all they came into the it. Time. Right, yep. they all came started into it. It was 60s. like in the 60s, yep. right. Because isn't that also when um, Chihuly started? Or there was a, there was well, a big- Well, Chihuly's late 60s. Right, but there was that start of the glass movement. Yes, right. 63. Yeah, okay, Summer 63, yeah. the Harvey yeah. Littleton. That's it, yes. And, and Harvey taught Dale 
and Dale, Dale went that's on, Dale Chihuly. Dale right. Chihuly. And then he right. went on to do to teach right. tons of people. Right. And and of course he was the best marketing person right. in glass ever. And then like my parents, so I think in the seventies they were just traveling and they went to and bought got some peace. And then they actually went to Italy to Murano. They just wanted to see the Murano glass. And Which so, is amazing. Yeah. And then actually where we have a, had a house in Vermont, in central Vermont, Simon Pierce, yeah. who is, he really, I mean, he's a, a glass blower, but he makes glasses and bowl. I mean, they're beautiful. I mean, and so my mother would buy the seconds, which just had like a little, because you couldn't afford the, yeah. you know. But, but they're still gorgeous. And then he really came over from Ireland. And then he actually, where he built his is on a, a hydroelectric dam. Yes. And he and then he teaches it. So then you also have all these students and now there's also a big movement on the East Coast to teach. It's like a it's called hot glass. Yep. Yeah, yep. right? And then isn't there um like a museum also, I think is it Toledo or is it that does where they actually do demonstrations. So oh, yes. it's become yes. it's also become recognized as a valid medium for artists. It so is. it is very in, much a hot Time, literally. In the museum world, that is happening. Right. But it's happening more slowly than in the marketplace, which delights me. I'll tell you right. why. Because we're ahead of the curve. Right. You know, who, who would think that we have a chance in Fort Wayne to be ahead of the curve on a major art movement? But we are. Right. And, he, and so here we are. And, and let's go back to this expansion. Okay. This wing, because we do need a wing. Right. We do need a wing. Is it a good time to do it in, in terms of collectors? Yeah, it's an important time because a lot of them are downsizing in the next three years. Right. So you need to do your wing now. Right, because they want to they want to take you, it, or their children need to plan the estate or however. Right. Yeah. Well, and also you know you need to show the collectors. I mean, these people have have given 20, 30 years to collecting, spent a lot of money, invested a lot of money, right. and are you serious? Well, they also want to make sure that you're not going to just put it on a shelf or put it in or your Or put it right. in the basement. Right. Or well, lock it up and back. Right. Right? So it's the time to do the one. Okay. Is it the time to raise $17 million? And is it the time to build? Right. Well, it's a terrible time to build. All the ex prices are up for everything. Well, supposedly they're coming down a little bit. Well, but a little. Yeah, but okay. In incremental. Right. And, and can you get a crew? But well, would it be cheaper to do it like if you did like an all glass wing or something? Like, so well, that, you that would, would be exciting. Right? Because it would be glass. So then maybe is glass cheaper? I don't know. Well. You need to find somebody, one of these collectors, who also you know. wants their name on a wing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just cool got back from Labor Day, and yeah. I'm walking through the museum, and right. somebody came up and said, "Well, have you made your decision yet? And what what would the what would these galleries look like in this new wing?" And I said, "Well, come here, I'll show you something." And so I took them down into the Summer of Glass, which is yes. hadn't closed yet. And Summer of Glass is those three galleries devoted to glass right. so, all summer. Because, and you've always said that. Some people in Fort Wayne, even if they don't um, feel that the museum is for them, there seems to be this attraction and interest in glass. Because you've been doing the Summer of Glass for quite a while. Eight years now. Yeah. So it's beyond, so th that was even before all of this. There seems to be something. But it's just so pretty. It, it, it is so pretty. Yeah. And it's, it's not um, imposing an intellectual right. Burden upon you right. that you're worried that you you can't handle. You know, I, right. I've never read about this. I'd never, I never right. know about this. So I said to the person who asked me the question, I said, well, well, you know, you see in there, that's what I want. That's my wing. Those galleries are exactly what I want to build over here. And as I was saying it to him, I thought, wait a minute, what, what did you just say? Those are the galleries I want to replicate over here. Why replicate them? That's the new wing. So July first next year. That wing of three galleries is devoted to nothing but glass, our permanent collection of glass. Okay, so when you, okay, so when you come into the museum, okay, so you got the Paradigm Gallery over yeah. here. Is it, so the, is it the, the one? The Rothschild Atrium full of glass. Right, so is it the one, so is it where you have it right now, where you have the uh, blank piece? If, if you follow the blank piece right. and turn left, right. you've got three galleries that will be perpetually full of glass. So, and so It'll just be our different. new glass wing. And somebody can name the wing. Two galleries of the three are, are named. Right. But then what are you gonna do? You still need a home for the things that you had, that you were using that gallery space for. You're still gonna need to do, I, I, I understand well, you're sort of coming gonna, up with a creative I'm, solution. I'm, I'm but, gonna, you know, what do they say? Ring the blood out of the stone right. for this though. Well, no, ring the blood out of the glass. The, out of the glass, there because, we go. But I think also then, as you get to know these, you know, uh, collectors and things, there may be 
so, you know, that would want. Well, it wouldn't surprise me at all because. Because then you could expand that out, yeah. It, but that's and, very exciting. Well, see, by, by, by doing it immediately, we, we're putting our, our hat in the ring in a serious way. Right. Uh, we're converting a former administrative office space slash my student space. Right. We're converting that to glass storage. Right. So I will have room as of March to add 1,400 pieces to the collection. Wow. And considering that I'd have 300 out on the floor and rotate in right. and out of that. Right. So all of a sudden, b before we build a wing, you, you I've got it. a wing and I've got storage. Right. And then you take a little time. You wait till the right. market's better. Right. Um, you wait till building is better. And you say, okay, now do we want another wing on top of that? Right. This would be a better time. Right. So we're not competing with anybody else's efforts right. in fundraising. And we get what we want overnight for almost nothing. Right. You know, I have to buy some new doors, I have to buy some new lights. Right. Okay, yeah. I could do that. Yeah. You know, that's not bad. And I've been, I'm not, this isn't, this is the first time I've ever said this publicly. Okay. But I have Ooh. said it in some telephone conversations yeah. in a couple of Zooms. And since I said it, this is, this was go back to the week after Labor Day. Okay. The first time I ever said it. Okay. Um, we've received 18 new significant gifts from people all over the country, sometimes one, sometimes two, uh, last week, nine. And it's like, what? Who are the nine from? You can't say yet? I can't say okay. yet. I can't say. And it's all because, now, how they, does this relate, though, like, because I know, like, the Toledo has a big glass, uh, they, they have a stake in the glass they world, do. right? And well, then it, was, I, it was a glass town. Right. And then I know, and then obviously I think around Corning, obviously, because yeah. from there, but they were more scientific, but they were still interested in glass. And then you told me about a woman down in Florida who was thinking of building a yeah. museum. Well, maybe she won't she need did. to build a museum now. Oh, she, oh, she already beat me to oh, it. Okay. So, Trish Duggan So how that, does that relate to, museum. how do you work together or collaborate or, because you said you want it to be for the premiere in the Midwest. So how would you differentiate what you do versus like Toledo? Well, and, and Toledo is the first thing you have to look at because right. in fact, it's a great museum. Uh, they've got a great new glass wing. They've mm -hmm. got the, the, the part where you see the glass in the mm -hmm. exhibitions and they've got the part where you make the glass mm -hmm. or you can watch right. them make the glass. Okay, I but, think you're going to have to plan some field trips for some oh, people. Oh, absolutely. And for, and for us, that yeah. to go and see this. Just a road right. trip. A road trip, Well, yeah. and, and the, the biggest difference, and I've been very careful to try to walk the par path care carefully, um, they have more emphasis on historic glass, which makes sense because it's a historic glass town. Right. And they have the contemporary glass, but we rival them in contemporary glass already. And I'm just getting started. You know, when we add another thousand pieces of glass, there's nothing like that in so, the Midwest. So how many pieces of glass do you currently have or coming? About 325. The, okay. And relative to how many pieces do you have in the permanent collection of the museum? Oh. Of the, over, over, the whole museum. Everything. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you a little comparison. Okay. Yeah. When I came, there were 1,100 pieces in the collection of anything. That's all? Print. Painting, So that sculpture, was 19 years ago. That was the whole ago. collection. Okay. okay. 8,000 and growing every week. 8,000. I added 300 prints this week. Wow. 300 historic American prints. And, and a lot of this is not through acquisition because, again, I mean, so it's like donation because the other thing was, so then the people who did the, the blank, the, um, yeah. that piece, then for whatever, then the, they gave it to the museum. They did. So you didn't have to pay for it. But then you also got, was it from them or someone else who gave you another blank piece? Oh, from a collector and a fan of Martin's out in L.A. Um, he said, I love what you did for Martin. I'll give you one from my right. house. So what people don't realize is because you um, – they, you set aside um, from your past capital, capital campaign a certain amount of money you had to uh, yes. acquire. Yeah. But a lot of this, like the glass and stuff, you're not buying. Uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of glass is coming in. More glass is coming in as gifts than purchases. And that's trend number one. Trend number two is artists are starting to step forward saying, I would give up my profit 
to be in the Fort Wayne Museum. Right, because of there's art. value for them, and the, also, but exactly. then also you could also do some and we visiting ship, we shows. We pay the shipping. Right. Well, yeah, but the visiting shows or stuff like. I mean, I was thinking um, in the botanical garden in uh, Miami. They, you know. Chihuly has these like amoeba kind of oh, absolutely. bulbs or something. They can be outdoors right. all the But time. I was thinking, you know, now if you really have that presence, then you could draw, you know, some of these kinds of exhibits because that would be incredible to have those all over. Wouldn't it be amazing? Downtown or at the, in the, the Botanical Garden. And so you could also then have other um, artists or even like the from the Blanco, which is out in... Um, Pennsylvania, the glass company that, and they, you know, they still have some um, but, collector's they do pieces. Work, but even yeah. to bring them here, because that would also link the manufacturing component of it. And then you also have the um, cut glass, right? It's the brilliant glass. Yeah, and that's the historical. That's right. our version of the historical. Right. But and you could also do things with that to show some of the elements. Like I always believe that. Um, like when it's like sort of when you see like I like an emerald cut diamond because it's flat and it, you can't there can't be any flaws because usually they cut There's nothing to right. disguise it. So when you look yeah. at like brilliant glass or crystal, they cut it, they make it ornate and stuff where there would be flaws. So but you but a lot of contemporary glass and art it's like there's it's flat. I mean there's no Yeah, if but there you was could, a flaw it right, would show. But you could show some of the influences or the diamonds because also how glass is made really hasn't changed. I mean, it's no, how they, no. it's just. It's, uh, it's what you use it for. Right. And, and Harvey Littleton and Nick Labino in 63, in Toledo, as a matter of fact, in a workshop for the Toledo Museum, their point was, why can't glass just be something I make a sculpture out of? You know, we make sculpture out of steel, wood, right. ceramic. Right. Why couldn't we make it out of glass? And it was a clunky workshop, but, but it stuck. And they were able to do it, and they were able to attract students who wanted to learn how to do it, and and so we have it. And in a flip flop for us, we have a smaller degree of historical glass, like the brilliant glass, right. and a bigger on the contemporary side. Right. So Toledo's got but maybe, just the reverse. Right, but but, but it's good for us. But museums share and don't uh, on loan pieces all the time, back and forth. Less with glass though. Oh, because right. of oh. the fragility, oh, right? That's true. And and yeah. the, the weight, glass is very expensive to ship. Yes, I would think so. It's got to be packed, right? Very and you pro yeah, you know, carefully yeah. and shipping. Yeah. So to get the Martin Blank, Martin Blank is a two two million dollar piece. To get the two million dollar piece cost me forty five thousand right. dollars in shipping. Okay, but it's still worth and labor. It. But still, oh yeah, and two million for forty five. Right, 000, but you're I'm also, sure. I think, so what people don't realize is that in very ways this is very. I mean, I think you had some what I call serendipitous moments or surprises about like people then calling and saying, but you were very intentional in developing this yes. um, and yes. the focus of it. But this isn't the first time that you've done something that's sort of what I think is very innovative and has had um, exponential impact. So you have these special collections that you do. Yes. And I remember, because I interviewed about David Shapiro, yes. where you yes. went and in New York and you were picking up all these, how many pieces did he give to uh, the museum? Over 800. Okay, and then and then you've also have, you've done special collections with Steven Sorman, yeah. Robert Kipnis, Katja Oakman, and Dennis McNett. And yeah. what you do there is you have very much large pieces of their work so that you can also become a research hub or a place for people to study that artist. Yeah, that artist okay. in, in depth. You could compare right. what did they do their their first year, what do they do? Their second, what, right. tenth, whatever. And in the case of Shapiro, there's another dynamic that we're just getting this is right, embarking right, yes. on. The notion that, and it's why we would take 800 plus pieces, the notion that we could help other museums also feature David's work and, and help David's memory stay intact by being not 800 pieces just at us, our museum, but all, at 800 other institutions. And as a matter of fact, we're about to do something with uh, St. Francis right now to uh, help help the students meet David's work by gifting to St. Francis a series of, of David's works that can go around campus. And I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah. It's gonna be a good project. And, and that's with Justin Johnson, as we've talked okay, about Okay, yeah, he's the, yeah. the head of the- um, He's terrific. He's the gallery Very forward-thinking guy. So what, what I'm thinking about was this was part of your gift in your in celebration of your hundredth. You're yeah. sort of giving a gift to people. Yes. But I was wondering, like, 
do museums do this? Like, is this, I mean, I don't ever well, think I hear of a, like, it, it, it doesn't it's happen? It's so unheard of. Okay. Some of the people we've called on the phone to say, you know, we'd like to give you a gift. Like, what museums? They, are, they, is they it, like, small know, museums? Like, big pardon? Is it small museums? Is well, it, truthfully, it started with the idea it could be any, any American museum that didn't have a David Shapiro. Okay. But, you know, I'm, I'm an underdog person, okay? So I think, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I, like, I like the sound of this around the table, uh -huh. but here's what I like the sound of better. How about we look for places that don't have a budget to acquire? How about we look for some, some places that nobody would do anything for? Mm -hmm. Let's do something for them. And Let's these make are, that work. And these, David, what is the value of them? I mean, we're not talking, these aren't hundreds of dollars. These are these are thousands, thousands of dollars. And yeah. even uh, the, average, the average Shapiro painting, if you were to walk into a gallery that, that has Shapiro, and there are still are four or five galleries that, that sell them, the average painting would start at about 25000 So this isn't a small gift. No, it's a okay. good gift. So it's a good gift. Why, why do it? I mean, what was the... For, for the good of David. For the good of David, for the... But that wasn't a stipulation in your getting no, the exhibit. I mean, no. getting the collection, It was right? something that his widow and I talked about. Could we pull it off? Uh -huh. And we were still talking about it when she died. And, oh, when and did I she didn't, pass away? She passed away really less than a month after she made the gift. Oh, okay. So that was like um, two, three years ago. That, two and a half years ago, I think. Uh, could be four. Four. Yeah, I lose yeah. track okay. of time with COVID. I know. You know? I know. But um, I'll tell you. So what is it like? You call up this museum and say, hi, uh, I'm Charles Shepard, and I have a David Shapiro that I just want to give to you. Do they, okay, this is a well, prank. Well, yeah, yeah. They, 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 is it a prank? Right. Um, see, we're, museums aren't geared for that conversation. So we've had people say, well, I guess, thank you. Could you send me a photo? <laughs> and you'd have to wait six months before my committee meets and you know, so on and so forth. So I think, okay, it's gonna take us a little longer right. to do than I thought. But once, you, but once one hears, I bet you then they're gonna start calling you. Because, yeah, I think and it'll, how many it'll are flip. You, how many do you want to get out there? Well, you know, originally I thought, let's get 100 out there. Okay. You know, as a starter, let's right, get 100 right. out there. And I'm, I'm still in that camp. But, you know, I'll tell you something else, too, that's come up, which has been related to this notion of gifting right. during, our, during our party. Let me give you yeah, a gift. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, we have things that we've acquired over the years, over the 19 years, that, you know, really aren't germane anymore. Um, they, they never were germane enough to hit the permanent collection. They are sort of in some cases a prop f for an exhibit mm -hmm. in some cases something we would study or use with kids mm -hmm. and and the best indicate here's the best example i can give you we have a carousel horse uh wooden um by a famous maker loof l-o-o-f and i loved it and i used it in exhibits for two or three years of americana right and you know, I don't know anything really about Louf. Uh, I mean, I've read a paragraph or two. The, the, the horse to me uh, should be restored, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I did not do that, right. you know. Um, so It should go this to like a one, toy museum the, or a... Well, it, it, it turns out there's a carousel museum in Sandusky, Ohio. Well, that's so, when a lot of the carousels were made, I think. Yeah. That, when they were yeah. made of wooden, so, the wooden carousels. So, so Jenna Gilly, who I just mentioned, is one yes. of our new curators. What is she I said, curated? Jenna, you know, what's her? What's well, her? her specialty is going to be glass, fashion, high end. Oh, you're going to do fashion. We're going to do fashion. Oh. We're going to do a big show on Bill Blass. Right, because he's from um, and Indiana. And we're going to do a big show about contemporary wearables. Well, you know, I worked at Women's Wear Daily. See? See, so I was the yeah, reporter you are, at the... You're going to be interested yeah. then. Oh, yeah. No, I, I've interviewed Bill Blass. So, so I asked Jenna, I said, look, look at this horse. Find out be, between you and and Suzanne Slick, um, who, who's your you, archivist. Yeah, you both love this horse, but find find it a home. So the two of them took off, and Suzanne, one went one way, one went the other, and Suzanne said, "You're not going to believe this. There's a carousel museum." And I thought, "I've never heard that ever. Where is it? You know, like in." France or, you know, what's the story? No, it's in San Sandusky, Ohio, and I just had them on the phone, and they know the horse. 
and they don't have any horses that are in the original condition, never been restored or retouched or anything. This is huge to them. So I said, okay, we'll tell them. Happy anniversary from us. Uh, Just paid for the shipping. That's, uh, yeah. Well, no, we drove it to them. They didn't have any oh, money. Oh, that's right. Oh, right. We uh, rented a truck and put two of our people in the truck, and we drove it to Sandusky. That's amazing. And gave them the horse. And, and also, so I think that what's important for people to understand that although you're focusing on glass and you're giving some of these Sh David Shapiro's and like you're yeah. taking some of these one-offs or maybe in the collection, because over the hundred years, sort of what the focus or the types, it's always been American art, but maybe emphasis, you're not, um, you're not, you're not just saying we're going to become a glass museum. I mean, that's no, not, not the goal. Of not it. at all. So you're still good. At, I mean, the main area is American art, correct? Yeah. And so, and, and the glass is international just because glass is international. Right, but there is a huge American. Um, yeah. But so I don't want people to think that you're just. No, we're not yeah. becoming a glass museum. No, no, and you're not giving away, you know. But that makes perfect sense. But it also helps to get the Fort Wayne Museum of Art on the map because now all these other museums and people are seeing it and taking a look and you know. Well, and you know we're also, in a, in a small way, we're, we're we're trying to give a different role model. Um, Museums are very uh, hermetic. I mean, they're very closed door. Yes. You know. Well, because uh, you right, and it's we, by nature we, you can look at it, you can't touch well, it. Right. You these can't, these right. are my things. Right. These are my things. Right. And you can have your things, but right. you're another museum. Right. And part of partly, I'm motivated by the idea that I can knock on your door. I am from my little cave, and you are in your little cave. But I'm knocking on your cave door, saying, "I'd like to give you something," you know, and. By example, maybe you could call me sometime and say, you'd like to loan me something. Right. You know, because the most famous thing in our business that nobody knows about is that we really don't like to loan things to other people in the business, in the field of museum. I say, well, I'm going to have a show about Picasso. Right. And you have a little drawing, a little pencil drawing, and I don't have one. Could you loan it to me for my show about Picasso's ceramics? Right. Uh, no, not really. Well, I know that it's not an important piece, and I know it hasn't, I, I look at your archives, it hasn't been on display in 20 years. Well, it could be too fragile, it could be too much work, I don't have anybody to box it up. I mean, we have all these excuses that sound wonderful, but the fact is museums don't play nice, and there's no reason for it. And I'll tell you what, our communities across the country, all our communities would benefit if museums would relax a little bit, you know, stop this and open your arms up mm -hmm. and s say, you know, hey, these are resources we could share, give, mm -hmm. loan, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. What do you have that you could share, give, and, and really do it? And then things would come to Fort Wayne, things would come to Cleveland, things would come to Los Angeles that are elsewhere, and they're never going to come there. Mm -hmm. But oh, that's, that's a hard thing to bring mm -hmm. up. You can't even talk about that at a museum conference. Hmm. So what percentage of the shows that you, or exhibits you put on at the museum in the given year um, are what you would call traveling, you know what I mean, yeah, shows? Yeah, a, a traveling show with a rental fee. Right, or, and are um, developed, you know, grassroots from your curators, would you say? Well, we, the, f the first half of that answer is that we, we do rent, traveling shows if the material is not available to us anywhere. The only way we could get it is to rent this show from this other institution. And, and that's, that's great. And museums are great about that. Right. They will rent you a show. Right. Um, now, we also can put shows out and rent them to other institutions. It's harder for us to do it, honestly, because these days, the staffs of all museums, ours included, aren't really deep enough to, to manage that traveling exhibit experience. And so what most museums really do is they outsource. Uh, there's a, a company called Museum Box. There's nine or ten different companies. Museum Box, I was on the phone with yesterday. And they, for a fee, will, you tell them what's in the show, and they arrange for all the crating, they sell the show, if you will, they market it, uh -huh, they sell it, uh -huh. they book the tour, uh -huh. and that's what they make their money on. And, and the museum picks up maybe 
22 percent and they pick up maybe you know 70 something right. percent right and and that, that's a great model but you know you've got to have some wherewithal to do that right and and i was talking to that that group i just mentioned because i i would like them to put david shapiro on the road and the so like anybody that's marketing anything they said okay give us the pitch and then we'll go pitch our salespeople. Right, who go out to the, And, and right. they'll see how many of our clients would take a David Shapiro Got show. It. And so we'll see. I don't mm -hmm. know what the answer will be. Mm -hmm. But that's how you get them out on the road huh. and really travel them. Yeah, we try to do it in-house with the staff I have. You can't. And nobody has enough time yeah. to... I mean, how many, how who many, does the how many curators do you really have? Oh, I've only got two and a half. Right. So, I mean, it doesn't work. So let's talk about, I don't know, Dale... Enox? Yes. Okay. So this, let's talk Marvelous about this, sculptor. this piece that is, what is the name of it that's the new piece it, in front of the museum that was oh, part of your rivers. hundredth? Oh, the rivers. The rivers. Okay. So let's talk about that because this was part of your hundredth. So let's talk about that. And I, I mean, I'm always interested in logistics in the back. So how did it come about and, um, and you know, the role it plays and what happened? Okay, let's take two steps back. I didn't know Dale four years ago. And I got a lovely invitation to go to Indianapolis to not just an opening of his exhibit uh, at a gallery, but at the Long Sharp Gallery, as a matter of fact. But it was an exhibit that after the cocktail party, the, the crowd left and there was a private dinner in the back room. And so here I'm at a table just there's not, maybe nine of us, and one being the artist. And I think, oh, nice guy, beautiful work. I really love the work. And we start talking, and he said, you know, I'm so pleased that you're here from Fort Wayne and whatever. And I thought, this guy's really happy. Why? Well, it turns out he's from Fort Wayne. It turns out he's studied at the Fort Wayne Art School. Which was connected which, to the original museum. That's right. right. And, and none of this do I know. So we're over here hugging and crying and having this experience of, like, I can't believe that we didn't know each other earlier, and I bought, uh, from that show, I bought two pieces for the museum, two large pieces, and... Are those on view yet? Yeah, they, they're on view yep. now. I put them, oh, I loved them, and I put them on view immediately in the Rothschild okay. atrium. And, and Dale, of course, came up, and he loved them, and so on and so forth, and it, and it led us to start talking about what else could we do together, what else could we do together? And I thought, okay, well, I haven't got a project yet, but let's see what might come about. Well, of course, here, here comes the hundredth. And I said, Dale, you know, I've got the hundredth coming up, and I feel like we should commission something. That would be our project. And you'd be the perfect person to be the artist in the project because you take us back to our history when we were in art school and a museum, and you're, it, it's like a homecoming for you, and, and we're the host. So let's, let's do a big work, piece. And doesn't he work in Indiana Limestone? Yes, he yeah, does. So there's that connection, yeah, too. Great right. connection. Right. And, and so, and he's, he's a very inventive artist. He's got the, he, he carves in the limestone, he makes prints, he works in aluminum. This piece is a combination of his limestone and his aluminum, and we just took off. And, and strangely enough, though, we took off and we had a solution fast. We knew what it was going to be. It was going to be an 18-foot tall piece of a, of a striding person, and we loved it. And, and over the course of maybe, I don't even think a week, maybe three or four days, it's almost a done deal. We've almost had a handshake. Right. He says, you know, could I talk you into something different? I think, what? He says, well, I, had, I got sketching this weekend, and I, I got a new concept. I thought, you know, I, I like the striding figure. Right. He goes, just, just bear and was with that, me. Was the striding figure based on sort of seeing the progression of his work till that up to that time? Yeah, it, it, it was. And what got him back in the sketching mode, though, was he's made one striding figure already. Right. But I'm just wondering, like, you know how they talk about artists in different periods? Yes. Or so, so when he said he wanted to show you something, I was thinking maybe he's moving into a new period well, that, or That's exactly what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I, I just don't feel, he said, coming back to Fort Wayne, I feel really like I'm on stage. And I don't want to do something I have done a version of. I said, okay, I'll, I'll listen. So what, what will you do? So he says, give, give me a couple of weeks. So he ruminates for a couple of weeks. And he comes up with the notion that 
Fort Wayne itself wouldn't exist as a city if it hadn't been for the convergence of the rivers and the and the traffic and the you know the commerce right. and, and all this. Right. If that gave rise to Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne became prosperous, which gave rise to the art school, which gave rise to the Museum right. of Art. Right. And it became even more prosperous, which gave rise to the Museum of Art being able to move into a new building in, 80, in 84. And he said, somehow I want it to be about the spirit of the rivers. I think, okay, sounds great to me. I said, what, what would it look like though? He said, well, you know, I don't know. I think somebody would be coming up out of the river. And I think, that sounds like a you know Martin Scorsese yeah. shot <laughs> uh, in Apocalypse Now with it coming out of the no I don't know about that he said give just let me work with it okay. and he worked it and he worked it and he worked it and he came back and it was bolder than anything we ever thought about it was almost as tall as as the first piece so it was big and imposing but it basically was the head and in this multi-layered aluminum and stone. Right is flow the rivers and they flow into the head so they flow to inform the mind of the city that would become hmm. Fort Wayne. Have you ever, have you watched it since we've had a lot of rain? Have you watched when the rain, how the rain... Yeah, you, see, you see the motion of the water. It goes through it. And in, in two weeks there, it'll be lit at night oh. from inside, up inside. Oh, wow. So you'll see the layering, you see the shadows on the brick. Right. So that this piece came out of a homecoming moment in Indianapolis, right. and here's our our big gift to the community for the hundred, and people love it. Yeah, so many selfies with yes, the, and, yeah. you know, on on and your now Facebook you have page. like you have a little bit of a sculpture row, you know, but how sure. does that? Um, so what is the, you know, because now also we've got the Public Arts Commission, yep. and we've got um, a lot of murals happening and public art. And how how does the museum? What's the museum's role? within that because now you've got some lovely you got there are four pieces right out well five actually yeah right out in front there so you're almost like a sculpture garden um how does how do you work together um or do you how do you see what they're trying to do and what the museum's role is well i think the desuvero piece gives us a gives us a great example and the desuvero piece which one is that one? that's the big orange piece that got hit by uh, a vehicle maybe four or five years ago okay and we got it restored and repainted just we repainted everything when dale was going to install because we wanted everything to look fresh and nice um okay well that's not on our land you know it it's a museum's piece but we in 2002 decided to move it onto city land to, so that it would be more accessible uh and not cramped in mm -hmm. you know like it, mm -hmm. Can you imagine a piece that big with the five pieces I've got? It's too much. Right. So more accessible. And I use that as an example because as other big pieces come into our collection, right. outdoor pieces, right. um, I think what we would want to do, and, and in fact we've already discussed it, at least initial discussions, is work with the Art Commission, of which I'm a member, and say, okay, where in Fort Wayne, not, not on my lawn, but where in Fort Wayne could we put three, four, six other major pieces by big name right. sculptures right. that would be good for the community. Where, so it would sort of be like be? the, you know, like the Storm Gallery. I mean, they have all that land, but they sort of put them all over. That's right. So you're just going to use all of Fort Wayne as the canvas of pus putting well, these artworks. I think it's the civic responsible right. thing to do. Right. Because then, in fact, rather than demanding that everybody has to come down into my back parking lot or my front lawn or whatever it right. is. They say, okay, it, it, these are in places that the city right. and the art commission think are important. And, and I, think, I think that's good for the citizenry. Yes. I also think it's good for corporations downtown. Right. Those are there. Those or are also in the neighborhoods. There. But I also think it's a great way because I still think that some people think that a museum setting isn't for them. And, yeah. or they don't understand it. Well, so, that's, that's exactly right. right. They, you know, I'm too shy. Right. I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Or I don't know I'm what supposed I'm supposed to, to wear. Right, and then people are also, so one of the things I really wanted to ask you about is this whole idea of, in art, people always are about if they like it or not. And we've become really a society of likes, yeah. you know, and yeah, how yeah. many. I'm wondering if um, that's still, because I just feel like like something, or if I like it, it's just become so gratuitous because you could just like someone's post or like that that's or whatever. That's right, that's right. But 
it, that's a lot about what art is, is if you like it or not. Has that sort of changed or evolved, or has it become more sophisticated in people trying to, because it's just, everything's likable or? Um, no, I, I don't, I, I think it, it's changed in this sense. Let's go to um, the last of the 19th century. We haven't quite gotten into the 20th yet, okay. You and I could both look at a piece. You might like it more. I might like it a little less. But you know what? The piece was going to be representational, right. which meant there are two figures in it. Right. They look like figures. Their arms are exactly the right length. Their, their necks are the proper length and everything like this. And, and so is it good? It's good. I mean, you you right. like it. Right. I, I'm not so sure I like it. But I know it's good and you know it's good because it... It's proportionately correct. Right. It's well painted. It's well crafted. Mm -hmm. 20th century changes all that. Right. The 20th century and, and modern art, you know, st start even with something as simple as Modigliani. His women look correct, except right. you look and you think her neck is like three times too right. long. Right. Right. Okay. So is he a bad artist because the neck's too long? No, he's expressing. Right, or like okay? Picasso. But so Picasso and, and all these guys. So now it's, it's blown open the fact that right. um, people don't like or dislike based on anything that is measurable anymore except how you feel. Right, but do you think that, I sort of feel like in some cases, That's okay. art shouldn't be about if you, I mean, if you're picking it for your house, you know, yeah. and they always say, if you're gonna collect, not don't try to collect to buy for the yeah. future, buy what you like. But I sort of feel like sometimes when you go to an exhibit or something, it may not be about if I like it or not. It may be about trying to understand the message or understanding that they were experimenting with something. Like, because personally, I don't like a lot of very modern art today. I mean, I like 20th century contemporary. Yeah. So, yeah. And I don't like a lot of the uh, more experiential kind of things or uh, digital types of things. Some of it I just feel so. But I don't think that it's if I like it or not. It's more trying to understand or the message. Or I just feel like maybe if people don't think about art, because sometimes they'll say, oh, I could do that. Well, yeah, yeah. but at the time when Joe Jackson Pollock was throwing paint on the floor, nobody was doing it. That's just so right. I think like if we try to get people away from thinking about, oh, if I could do it or not, and also if they like it or not, but understanding it and why it's a good piece. Like, because some people will say, well, why is this at a museum? Like you said, because there are certain aspects of it. And maybe that helps them to develop a palette of, well, look at, because I just think like if people go, well, I don't like it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think you do develop a palette. I, I think you, because you can't, because nobody's going to judge you for liking or not liking anymore anyway. Right. Okay, so you, you have freedom now. You have freedom to ex express your love or lack of, and, and that freedom's good. And, and the freedom makes you more willing to look at things. Right. Because I'm not going to judge you when you say, I'm looking at this, and it's not for me. You know, I think, okay, but what kind of things do you like? Okay, but I just wonder... Should the end goal of someone coming to a museum to look at art to be to decide if they like it or not? I don't believe no, you're that right. that should be the, the emphasis of it. Well, you, you could have something that resonates with you, makes you feel, makes you, draws you in, but I, don't, I just feel like we're just got so caught up in this like and dislike well, society and that. The museum is, is the place where you should go or you do go for some sort of neutral learning experience. So I may not like it, but you know what I learned? I learned that DeSouvre was trying to revolutionize right. sculpture by right. working with industrial steel. Right. Huh. Now, I don't think I like that. I would never buy one, but you know, that's an interesting point mm -hmm. because he wasn't pouring mm -hmm. bronzes. Mm -hmm. He was taking, you know, I-beams from a skyscraper and cutting them up and shaping them into right. an orange thing on the lawn. And I think, okay, I learned something out of that. So I think, I think outside our doors, you can run around thumbs up, thumbs down, right. all you want. Right. When but you I, come in, I think, you, I think people come in intentionally to learn about this thing. Um, or to be encountered with it. Or, but so I think, you know, it just, people shouldn't be thinking that they're going to a museum to 
if they to see if they like or dislike me. It should just be your just go like no judgment, yeah, no yeah, expectation. Just, just go. Go and have an experience and see. Right. Well, you know, it's fascinating because we had the Muka show earlier this yes. year, and Muka's works are very very beautiful, and yeah, the, the thing I heard more than any other comment was. They whisper to each other, he was in advertising. Think, wow, so what? They're beautiful things. And, and that was a, a, a big surprise for people. Mm -hmm. He was in advertising. Mm -hmm. Like that beautiful lady is actually on the cover right. of a magazine. But he's what do to people sell. think ads are? It's a subliminal way to, you know. Th that's right. right. Well, and, and, and the graphic. See, today we compartmentalize yes. so easily right. that certainly a graphic designer is not really an artist. Well, that's not true. No. There are very successful artists using their talents to get their thing to market. Right. And get an audience for right. it. So actually their job is probably bigger than, you know, the person that sits up in their attic and does a bunch of splashy paintings. Right. And there's no judgment. Right. Okay. There's a lot of judgment for that graphic designer. Yeah. So Muka did a lot for all the graphic designers in town, I think. Like, elevate them. Elevate them. Right. Appreciate this. But it was so funny because people come in and go, it's so beautiful, but I think they're trying to sell something. I said, yeah, they are. Right. That's what he was doing. But it was good that you didn't hear that they liked or disliked it. Because no. I just think we need no. to get people. And I think if people would go to a museum just knowing that, just go. Like, it's not about you like it or dislike Just go and see what, well, what's, what happens. Ha have an experience. Right. Have an experience. Yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting too, Muka drew an audience that I would, I would tell you probably wasn't coming for the glass, they were coming, coming for, for the Right, and I okay. bet you, you probably got a and lot younger. They would say, they would say um, at the front desk, where's the Muka? Where's mm -hmm. the Muka? Okay, mm -hmm. so I know, I know you're going this way. Mm -hmm. and but the, then they would wander around. That's right. And the people saying, where's the glass, where's the glass? You know what? Wait five minutes and they, they peek into the other one's right. galleries. Like, oh, I came for the Mooka, but the glass was pretty nice. Well, I didn't, what's the Mooka? Oh, it's in that room over there. Oh, the Mooka's beautiful, but I came for the glass. But so that's, the whole idea that's a coming. great, right. that's you the, know, you open your mind up, open your eyes up. Right. Yeah, it was super. So at the end of each and Good Company program, I ask guests the same 12 questions that were popularized by French novelist Marcel Proust. But you have already answered my first original 12 questions. So. I have another baker's dozen for you. Okay. What is your idea of perfect happiness? Oh, my job is it. My idea of perfect happiness. I go, I go into my sandbox every day and play my heart out. What is your greatest fear? Time. What trait, what is the trait you most deplore in yourself? I could be more humble. Which living person do you most admire? My wife, Amanda. What is your greatest extravagance? <laughs> Grocery shopping. <laughs> and that's absolutely the truth. Amanda must love that because she probably sends you with a list. <laughs> yeah. And you probably don't come up back with half the list, but all these other all interesting these other things. things. That's right. What is your current state of mind? I'm very upbeat right now. That's uh, not unusual for me, but I'm particularly upbeat. Well, you have a lot this okay, morning. Right. Good. On what occasion do you lie? <laughs> when I bought too many things at the grocery store and I've left them in the car. <laughs> is that all you got? Uh, it is. Uh, and she knows I'm lying. Right. You w bring in the other bags from the car. Okay. Which words or phrases do you most overuse? Wow. What talent would you most like to have? <laughs> I guess I, I dreamed of being an artist originally. But you are. And as I became an art historian, I realized critically I wasn't any good. <laughs> I don't know. I like that piece that you had in last year. Oh, well, that was one of that, that was, was a, a good really piece. good one. Yeah. yeah. What is your most treasured possession? Boy, that's a tough one. Because I know you have certain things you keep on your desk that yes. you like. Yes. I, I think probably the beautiful Bible that Amanda gave me two years ago for Christmas. 
What do you most value in your friends? In my friends? Candor. What is your greatest regret? Oh, I have a long list of those. <laughs> What's on the top? Okay, greatest regret. Um, maybe I don't have a long list of those. Because I'm coming up with the opposites. I'm coming, like, so maybe a year after I got here, I was offered the head job at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. And I, I turned it down, and a lot of my friends regretted that. And I think, that's not a regret of mine. I was gambling on Fort Wayne. I'm happy I did gamble on Fort Wayne. You doubled down. Yeah. Okay. If you were to die and come back as a person or thing, what would it be? Or who would it be? Okay. <laughs> this is another example of my lack of humility. I'd come back as myself for another round. <laughs> And maybe do the things that you regretted the first time. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. Right. Well, I want to thank Charles Shepard, the president and CEO of the Fort Wayne Museum of Art, for having a seat at our table. And I've realized that um, we can't wait another year to have you come. I think we need to have you come right. a little bit more frequently because there's a lot of exciting things. And I think we need to keep checking in and finding out. And I would love to come visit with you and chat. Great. Well, Indeed. perfect. I really look forward to it. So thank you. Thank you very much. And you can learn more about Anne Good Company and all the other great conversations we have had at annegoodcompany.info. And we look forward to next week when you can again enjoy a seat at the table for great conversation and good company. Oh.